First of all, we wanna say thank you. This is our second virtual open house and it's for spring term that believes it, believe it or not, starts Monday, April um, 5th. We've been one year and one month into the pandemic and we'll chat about that a little bit later, but it's like we're now seeing light at the end of our tunnel. So thank you to all of our facilitators without whom we wouldn't have an OLLI program. Those of you that have been affiliated with an Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, um, there are 124 of them across the country, only five of whom, five of which are located on community college campuses. And the number one mission we have is to provide academic not-for-credit programming for adults 50 years and beyond. And within that, we're tasked with other items, but one in particular is to buy, is to provide uh, viable and sustainable ways for OLLI members to be leaders and teachers. And that's what we do here at OLLI at, Sedona, at Yavapai College and in specifically Sedona and Verde Valley. We are one OLLI Institute, but we have a campus, a big campus in Prescott. And then we also, those of you are all members of our Sedona Verde Valley side. Um, so we are one, one institute with two programs servicing all of our very, very large rural county. Um, I will give, because we want Lorna to get a chance to start at the end, if anybody wants to see it, we have a year in review to let you know what we did during the pandemic or what you all did. And we'll share that instead of now, we're gonna go straight into our presentations. So I will go ahead and stop my screen share and our first presenter today is going to be Lorna McDonald. Lorna is having a little bit of technical issues. Every person on this uh, screen I'm sure can relate to that. So we're gonna move her up the line and let her tell us about her class. Lorna, take it away. Oh, you're on mute. I think it's automatically. Okay, how's that? <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm Lorna McDonald. I have a background in education and my before my background in education, I had a background in comparative religions. So today I'm going to introduce the, um, the five books and we're just going to breeze through. This is going to be like a flashlight tour. We'll breeze through the, uh, the slides. Uh, Everything is very interesting when you start taking a look at historical documents. You don't have the actual document. Uh oh. Mute again. All right, I'm back. So I'm going to go ahead and put it into um, my PowerPoint presentation. But okay, this timeline is going to be from 7000 BC to 540 BC, and we're going to look at five books. I'll show them next. And um, it, these are the world culture texts. These are very well known. And the modern versions, they have all survived through the ages. We're going to be looking at Zoroaster, which will be the left front. Uh, 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 the Buddhist, so the Dhammapada. We're going to look at pre-dynastic Egypt. We'll look at the Bhagavad Gita, which is um, a, a much later than the Rig Veda, but the Rig Veda, we'll, we'll mention that briefly. And then finally, the, the Hebrew. So the, I call it the Egyptian Hebrew. A brief time. I fear we have just lost Lorna. Lorna. Okay, Hebraic Tongue Restored, which is the, um, this is the Torah. So originally in the Torah in 540 BC, and we'll be covering the interesting uh, fact about the, uh, the Torah and the relationship between uh, Zoroastrianism and the Torah. So. Uh, everyone might know the uh, Cyrus. Hang on a second, I'm, I've lost. Um, Lorna, it may be better if you just talk to us and take away your image. Sometimes that helps 
because okay. you're you're coming in and out on us. Okay, I'm so sorry. We are as well. Yes. So you should be seeing the Cyrus the Great and the Zoroastrianism. And uh, we didn't certainly didn't learn this in school, but Cyrus the Great was a follower of Zoroaster. And he is the one who freed the, the, the Hebrews um, in their second captivity in Babylon. And this is, this is the, last, um, the last date. As much as we want to hear about you, we are, um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm just going to, we're going to have to move on. I'm so sorry. Okay. We are no, not that's very fine. Thank that's you. That's fine for because I, yes, I will, I will have, I will have it uh, fixed. I will contact my provider. Um, okay. Thank you okay. again for teaching All right. us. And, Thanks, uh, Linda. <laughs> we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, I guess we just saw an illustration of what the last 13 months have been like. Thank you, Lorna, for trying to make all that. Right, all right, all right. I'll talk with you guys soon. Okay, great. And thank you all for um, uh, your patience uh, as we yes. uh, move forward. So um, what I would like to do now is um, move on to Charles. And Charles, uh, would you tell us which classes you are teaching? Because I believe you're teaching more than one. So just tell us who you are and tell us about your class here next, please. You're muted, Charles. Charles, you need to unmute or Linda unmute him. First to go back and find that. Okay. There we go. Uh, is that okay now? Yes. Thank okay. You. Good. Thanks. Uh, I've spent a lifetime in uh, public uh, policy and international affairs since I was a student in Mexico a long time ago. I've worked in the government. I've started in, and can continue to work uh, as an independent consultant. Uh, I've had a little teaching experience at Penn and American University, and I've done maybe a dozen uh, courses here at Ali. This spring, as I said, all new uh, courses, uh, two workshops, two learning groups. Um, I, I'm, I'll go through. I'll, I'll go through them for the interest of time. I'll do them separately. Uh, the first uh, I want to mention is a one-day workshop on a beautiful book written by a friend of mine. What you have heard is true, Carolyn Forche's book. Uh, she was invited by a guy who uh, we both knew, uh, who was the only the only person actively, her heroically, courageously trying to end the civil war in El Salvador in the early 1980s. It lasted until the 1990s. This is her memoir of that experience. It's an absolutely beautiful book. Uh, I, I'll, I served in El Salvador in the embassy before Carolyn was there. I'll give some background on the country of the civil war and the peace, but the, the book should be the centerpiece of this experience. Uh, it really is a beautiful bit of literature, even if you don't care about El Salvador. Um, Charles, do you mean to have slides on? Yes. They're not showing. Well, they're up. I'm seeing them. Hang on a second. When I went back, let me do, let's try and do it again. I'll load it again. No, that's not right. Hang on a second. Uh, I'm screen, screen, yeah, I want a screen share. When I backtracked, something got dropped. Try sharing again. I think you shared. I'm going try, to try to stop it and then start it again. Uh, yeah, now the trouble is it's off the desktop. I'm not finding it on my desktop. It was there before and it's, here it is. There I'm you go. Sure oh, no, I, I didn't change anything. That's what I was trying to do before. Okay, the first book was this, What You've Heard Is True. I say beautifully written by, a, she's actually an award-winning poet. 
but this is written in prose and it's utterly moving and evocative. Uh, it'll explain a lot about why people for a long time have felt the need to abandon their country in, in uh, Central America. Uh, the second book I want to deal with is by another friend, Clyde Prestowitz, who's written a brand new book called The World, is, the World Turned Upside Down. It's about China's uh, struggle, of China's ambition to uh, supplant the United States as a global leader. Um, it's interesting because he's a real expert uh, he, on China. He used to be an expert on Japan. He's the only person I know who's twice uh, was invited uh, to uh, for one-on-one -on -one briefings with President Obama uh, on China policy. Uh, I would say, Clyde would say that Obama didn't listen very carefully. <laughs> so the book is... Uh, uh, the book is about that and what the U.S. and China both need to do uh, to create some stability for this uh, uh, new global arrangement. Uh, it's a, it's a well-written book. It's not very long. Uh, anybody who's taken workshops with me in the past on U.S.-China relations will find this like the, the next best step. Then uh, I have a learning group which goes the other way. It looks backwards at the origins of the US-China relationship going back to 1776. Um, I don't want to make this a dry history. Uh, instead, my uh, intention is to tell stories this kind of show and tell, historical show and tell about key personalities and key events on both sides, Chinese and Americans. And I'll, I'll stick some Brits in there too because they caused a lot of trouble. If this works, uh, we'll come out of this with a deeper understanding of all of the, or the many dimensions of the great power rivalry that we have with China. It's not a new thing, it's actually an old thing. And this will help you understand that. And then finally, I have a, a four week uh, learning group uh, loosely based on this book, um, Our Man. It's an incredibly well done book by George Packer about a high-flying, sometimes successful, and sometimes spectacularly uh, failing uh, Richard Holbrook, um, who had an ego bigger than, than his ambition, which was almost unlimited. Uh, the book is really a, a terrific read. It's 500 pages. So what I'm going to do is summarize in e each of the four sessions, I'll summarize the book and introduce some videos about Holbrook himself, Packer, the author, Barack Obama, and other people uh, supporting and criticizing Holbrook. And the, the objective will be through our discussion to try to identify the lessons that were learned and the lessons that should have been learned from the big episodes in, in Holbrook's career in Vietnam in the 60s, in Bosnia in the 90s, in Afghanistan where he actually died trying to end the war uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so in this case, I'd say you could read as much of the book as, as you want. Uh, I'd encourage you to, but it won't be necessary. Sorry for my you know, hiccups, but if you've got any questions, please feel free to call me by phone or by email. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And um, having been able to attend just snippets of Charles's classes, I would recommend all of them, especially if you're interested in world affairs and history and, and politics and uh, very timely for what we do today. So thank you, Charles, so much. And Charles is also one of the uh, co-leader founders of our Friday Faculty Lounge. Those of you that are teaching should be getting those announcements for monthly meetings where we gather as our colleague faculty to discuss relevant issues and ideas. And there's opportunities for our faculty to actually take over a program and lead a session. So our next one will be on April 12th and you'll be receiving information from us about that. Now I'm excited. Our next presenter is Jeff Bush. And Jeff, um, I'm looking for you on my screen. Are you here? Great. Um, Jeff, I hope I'm here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jeff. I'm glad you're here. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us, uh, tell sure. us the name of your class and um, a little bit about your class. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Linda. Um, again, I'm Jeff Bush and I'm facilitating the Arts and Culture in Venice uh, course. Uh, my fascination, I suppose, with Venice came from attending a professional conference there about 15 years ago and instantly getting hooked. And so I, have, I use every excuse I can to get either back there or to begin to talk about it. So this is a, you know, this is a prime vehicle for me. Um, if you've been to Venice, you know that it's one of the 
truly unique cities in the world. And there's a Venetian saying that says, it takes only a day to walk from one end to the other of Venice, but it can take over a lifetime to actually learn about it. And in many ways, it's kind of like Sedona in my opinion. Um, photographs really don't do it justice. You have to be there and see it. Um, a little of the history side of it as it relates to this, Venice was an independent republic for over a thousand years. And part of the reason for this was that it was one of the world's major trade centers and therefore was very stable. And they aligned themselves with whoever uh, was in power at that, pretty, at that particular time. It was one of these, you know, where they checked the wind, which way things were going. Um, but because of this wealth, it led to incredible investments in the arts. And that's one of the uh, real benefits of going to Venice and talking about Venice is that there's this huge wealth of information. Um, one of the other fascinating aspects about the arts is that in many cases, uh, particularly the visual arts are exactly where they were four, five, six, seven hundred 700 years ago when the artists created them. So when I do lead a group there, we oftentimes spend our time just wandering up and down the streets, sometimes with a gelato in hand, I might add, um, looking at the buildings, uh, going into churches, et cetera, and actually experiencing the arts as opposed to kind of uh, reading about it. My own background is as a, a musician, a, a music and arts professor, but we will focus a fair amount of our interest on visual arts in this course, just because of the history and what's actually available. We'll spend a fair amount of time on architecture, some on um, music, but we're doing things that uh, occurred typically up until 1797 when this Napoleon fellow kind of came and screwed up uh, Venice completely. Uh, we, were, we will spend some time in contemporary issues, particularly talking about uh, Carnival and the masks and, and the Biennale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we get a, a feel for everything. Um, part of my reason for talking about history when we're doing this and, um, is that it, it, everything is interconnected. Um, where we are with a lot of it is even with the commerce side. So for instance, part of the reason that oil painting became so prevalent and so strong in Venice was that they had the semi-precious stones and the materials to ground up to make the colors for the paint. Likewise, uh, because it was a seafaring nation, they had lots of canvas around when it was hard to get in many other places. Even um, Murano, the famous glass center, um, was successful partially because of all the compounds that they could grind down, that they got internationally that couldn't be uh, achieved elsewhere. So there was a variety of different resources there. Um, so anyhow, that's, I hope, just a, a tiny little feel for kind of the direction I think we're going, particularly those that have uh, any interest or knowledge. I'm happy to go in a number of different directions. And I did think that what I would do, um, I've collected masks. I know a couple of the mask makers very well, and I've collected a number of masks. So I took a couple off my wall this morning. Um, sadly, I'm only five, six, so I couldn't reach them all. So I just took the easy ones. So um, just a couple of the masks that uh, I've collected over the years. So there's my one of my leaves. And then wow. one of the charlatans. So thanks so much. And I hope some of you are interested in joining us. That's it for me, Linda. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, 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 Becky, did you have a question? You're on mute. Well, well, let's see what we're getting. Becky unmuted. Are you unmuted? Okay, now I am. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, what is the title of your course? Sure. It's Arts and Culture in Venice. Okay. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jeff. You're, you and Charles, all of you, um, are the reason I look forward to retiring years and years from now. But um, I've only been to Venice once, and I found it captivating as well. Thank you so much. This sounds like such a great course. So next in our queue, um, Tony Caetano. Tony, remember to state the name of your course and who you are. 
Okay, uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you at this open house. Um, I think most of you know me as a person who's been uh, working on the Leadership Council for the last nine years. Uh, I'm a retired special education director and educator and teacher and facilitator. Uh, I'm happy to announce that Ali at Night is back. Um, and we're going to have a, a course on Wednesdays titled One Day University Lecture Series. And it goes from 545 to 8 o'clock. <clears throat> and I see some of the familiar faces here. Hope, hopefully you join us again. Hi, Marge. I'll wait for you to. Uh, this is a, a great uh, uh, series of lectures from the best uh, lecturers uh, from all over the, the country. And if I can share my screen. Uh, yeah, they, uh, there we go. Is that screen up? Yep. Okay. Uh, there are hundreds of fascinating and talented lecturers, over 200 professors from 150 top tier schools. And uh, we, we can watch uh, professors' lectures on uh, history, uh, arts, uh, science, um, let's see now, what else? A, a whole bunch of things, uh, politics, uh, <clears throat> government, uh, and uh, I think Charles has, has viewed one of those uh, sessions that was done, and uh, they're very, uh, very informative and uh, it's amazing how these guys can talk for 90 minutes without any notes. Uh, they're wonderful, entertaining uh, lecturers. So that's one of my courses. Uh, another course that I'm doing is called uh, The Art in Aging. And that is a workshop. Uh, and I'm, hopefully I'm sharing my screen. And I got this quote from uh, Leck that says, youth is the gift of nature, but age is a work of art. And what we will be discussing is the uh, biological, psychological, and social research and on growing old. We'll, we'll talk about the what's common with aging, what is not normal, and the key components of successful aging. And we will have one of the professors from the University of uh, One Day University Lecture Series, Dr. Brian Carpenter, uh, give us a, uh, a talk on the trajectory of aging, which gets shaped very early in life, but there are steps you can take to maximize your later years. The, he is very uh, entertaining. Uh, and uh, very excellent information uh, to present, and we will discuss that. Um, I also teach a course on grant writing for nonprofits as, uh, and a, uh, a real esoteric one, uh, Wisdom of the Enneagram, uh, which is uh, uh, a, sort of like a Myers-Briggs, only a thousand years older. The, uh, those are my courses. One couple of plugs that I'd like to put in for Ali. Uh, number one, uh, all of you facilitators uh, have received vouchers to take courses. I would uh, encourage you to use those vouchers so that you can experience these wonderful courses. Uh, another vehicle for using your voucher is to put it towards your membership. So there are a couple of nice options or benefits you get for being a facilitator. And the last thing I want to plug is the Ali 300 Club, where we're looking for 300 people to donate $300 to Ali so that we can be self-sustaining and not have to worry about uh, closing up the shop. So thank you very much. Uh, look forward to uh, your participation. 
you, Tony. I appreciate all the courses, and I'm glad that we're back at night, although I'm an early morning person, so you won't see me at your night classes. Um, I did want to remind everybody that summer course proposals are now being accepted and will be accepted through April 20th, and anyone may submit those. At the end of the meeting, we'll talk more about what potentially could be our options for teaching during the summer. But I know you're here to hear our, from our uh, facilitators. So next is Ray Ebling. And Ray, remember to tell us the name of your course and a little about yourself as well as about the course. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I think, okay, uh, wait a minute. I'm just trying to get the screen, uh, screen share going here. Uh, well, this is weird. Why is this not doing what it usually does? Uh, shoot, this is not working the way it usually does. So when you go to share, there you go. There we go, no. So when you go to share screen, there's a basic tab and you need to then highlight which. Uh, the thing from the, the um, well, this is extremely frustrating. I mean, I've only done this a hundred times and I've never had it happen like this. Um, Did you hear, well, I guess we have a couple options. Margaret Joy was correct in what she was saying, but if you just wanna to talk to us about your class, we would love that as well. And we can, we know you're a talented artist. What are your, what is your class this time? Okay, I'm teaching drawing. Um, this is very distracting. Um, I'm teaching drawing outside live or via Zoom, but I guess we just learned that it will be outside live. Um, drawing, it, this is not like drawing pictures. Um, are you seeing a screen share that shows the virtual open house? No, um, Ray, actually what I see is uh, your, uh, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your um, I don't know if you're in Google or what you're in. I can see right. all, all your internet uh, tabs. My problem is that the, the Zoom uh, controls are covering the tabs that, ah, you can move that. You can just move that taskbar down. I think. So that's what I just did. And here's the slide. Okay. okay. Now, now it would help if I move the taskbar too, right away from the middle of the slide. We'll put it down here at the bottom. I didn't know you could move that. Okay. This is excellent. Okay. We now have a big slide, right? Yay. Does everybody see that? Yes or no? Yeah. Linda, are we seeing this? Okay. So this is drawing outside live, and I guess it will be drawing outside live. Um, this, uh, so I kind of thought it was going to be via Zoom when I prepared these slides. So this is, uh, I was thinking it was a question of what is real and what is virtual, and Sorry. what do we really see? Sorry, is it real? What we see, is it real or our own version, i.e. virtual? This, by the way, is a Saturday morning class, which is kind of exciting. Um, this class is not about drawing pictures. Um, it's more about seeing and making marks. And we're going to be able to use color. I don't encourage people to take paint. But if you're an experienced artist, you want to do watercolor or something outside, that's OK. But generally, this is, this is short sketches of things that is quite a, a wonderful drawing of a picture, isn't it? Or maybe it's a photograph. I'm not sure. Um, this is a Zentangle, which is pattern making patterns, which some people love to do. Um, I, I'm not very good at this because I do three little whatever it is, and then I've got to change it. I mean, for me to fill a whole space with one pattern is impossible. There's a very famous Picasso drawing. I think that's Picasso. Anyway, um, this is a very experimental class. Uh, I draw heavily from the book, Drawing from the Right Side of Your Brain, uh, drawing from your eyes to hand uh, as a way to see what we're really seeing. It's a discovery process that involves getting the brain out of the way. 
and and it exercises your right the right side of your brain. So all you scientific historical uh, intellectual people, think about doing this on Saturday morning, even if you haven't drawn since first grade, uh, you might might discover some things. Now, um, I guess this is a picture of the outside versus this is one of the pictures I would use if we have to do it via Zoom. Um, I, I have done this class very several times in the classroom and have done it outside. But this outside class will be much more experimental than the previous one. This is one of my favorite artists, William Robinson from Australia. I just love this drawing, maybe because I grew up on a farm. Uh, I just think those, those cows are, are marvelous. And this um, shows the kind of experimental drawing that I hope to inspire people to instead of uh, rendering, although what I call rendering. If people, um, as people may know, I'm, I'm very abstract in my thinking and art. I was a history major. I, I was four years at School Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, ending up doing sculpture. I was in a computer programmer for many years, um, which I did love. I, was in a, I had a very interesting job. I worked for Home Depot for a couple of years, which was an interesting experience. That was after I retired, but then decided maybe health insurance was a good idea. And uh, I've been with Ollie for 15 years and caught, taught courses from investing to, uh, oh, I don't know what, art to creativity to um, gardening. Oh, I teach a lot of gardening classes. Um, some people, this is what can be done with a colored pencil. Wow, and don't ask me how they did it. I can't imagine. I was playing with colored pencils a little while ago and said, ah, this isn't for me. But everybody's different. And that's what I try to encourage people to do in the class. Um, the Zentangle is a very meditative. There are a lot of these sort of color book where people color in the, the, the thing, as you see on this left hand, this left hand one. Um, but I, I, I really encourage people to make your own abstract design or realistic design, whatever you want to, but don't just color in somebody else's design. Discover your own creativity. So this class will be quick experimental sketching, either realistic or abstract, whatever suits you. Uh, and I, it's open. I love to get people who, who um, by the way, it's not in the catalog because we didn't think we'd be able to do it live outside. So uh, please spread the word, particularly to all those people who say, I'm just not creative. I can't draw. Everyone is creative. They're alive. So that proves that they're creative. Otherwise they wouldn't be alive. They just haven't discovered their own creativity or it got squelched by their third grade teacher or their first grade teacher or whatever. So I particularly encourage men. I've never had men in a drawing class. So I challenge some of you guys to get outside your box. Usually my drawing class is called Drawing Outside the Box. Um, to get outside your box and, and try something different. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Terrific, great. Thank you. Ray is, um, um, let's see, Ray, you want to go ahead and um, uh, stop, stop your screen there. share? Can you do that? It's at That's the very what top. I'm trying to find. Oh, it's there okay. it is. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, we are excited about Ray teaching um, because she is actually going to be teaching um, on online for us, not online, but Ray is also going to be teaching um, for us outdoors. We have been given permission to have our three outdoor classes, Ray's art class and our two hiking classes to be offered in April. So thank you for being willing to do that. And we're excited to see how that will go. It's good news for all of us and very good news voting for us for summer. So our next um, presenter will be Paul Friedman.
Hey, Paul, it sounds like you're muted if you're probably talking. Yeah, and here I am. You can hear me, I hope. Yes. Great. Uh, I'm sharing this slide. Uh, can you see a slide? Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, going to be teaching at Ali this spring on Thursdays, three classes uh, during that day. Uh, the first is from 8.30 to 10, and it's called Leadership Principles and Practices. It's um, for people who are involved in organizations who would like them to function better uh, and who would like to exert some leadership. You don't need to be the leader, but uh, you will, uh, from what you learn in this class, you'll learn how to make things happen that wouldn't have happened otherwise, which is in a sense uh, what leadership means. We will be drawing on the wisdom of Ronald Heifetz, the director of the Harvard Kennedy School Center for Public Leadership and co-founder of the Cambridge Leadership Associates. Uh, uh, we'll see video clips from his workshops and uh, use his ideas and we'll be discussing them and we'll be uh, working together to uh, be more effective uh, in having influence among the people we want to uh, in, create a change. By the way, I started and was the director of a leadership program at the University of Kansas for about a decade and uh, worked with many leaders and uh, helped many people uh, create innovations in the organizations, maybe uh, in your community, in an HOA or at Ali or uh, at a, in a a uh, church or synagogue group, uh, a business, um, a committee that you're on anywhere. This will help you learn how to be more effective. From 11 to 12.30, whoa, I'll be uh, facilitating a class called uh, the best TED Talks of 2020 and 2021, which are uh, the latest talks being presented in the TED uh, talk system. Uh, the TED organization posts uh, several hundred a year, maybe two, three hundred a year. I'll go through them and select which I think would be the um, oh, 50 or so that I think would be most relevant to Ali members. And then I'll ask the people who enroll in the class to narrow it down to three talks per session. So people will be watching and then discussing uh, three TED Talks at each session that they have participated in selecting. And then in the afternoon, I'll be teaching a class called Glimpses of Enlightenment based on the work of uh, Locke Ke Kelly, who is uh, my currently my favorite uh, spiritual teacher, innovator. Uh, and uh, it, his approach is to teach how to shift your thinking from uh, problem solving and uh, coping with the everyday, with the situations of everyday life to a uh, more open, loving, awake, present, uh, expansive state of mind. And it can be done in an instant. It doesn't last for a lifetime. Uh, and in fact, it's an approach to awakening or enlightenment glimpse by glimpse by glimpse by glimpse. So it's adding moments into your day when you're um, feeling free and open-minded and open-hearted. Um, and it's uh, useful from morning to night. Uh, so those are the three classes that I'll be teaching and uh, your participation would be very welcome. I'm done. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate very much. And I admire your ability to teach all day like that. It must feel, feel like you're back on the college campus teaching one course after another. Thank you so very much for uh, uh, teaching for us. We appreciate that very much. Yeah. Um, next, we have Marge Haas. 
So I'm going to move myself, Marge. Don't forget to remind us what you're teaching and also mention your special interest group. Hello, this is Ray. I'm Marge Haas, and my interest has always been music. My background is in church music and piano and organ. And here we are. Get this off. My, my music course this semester is Bach. Beethoven, Bartoli, and beyond. I chose the um, the composers that start with B. Now we have a lot of fun in this course. We want to see if you can identify Bach or not Bach. We play little snippets the pieces. Not all at once. Is that Bach or not Bach? Another composer we're going to wow. be looking at is when YouTube works, it works really good is Beethoven and probably most of you have not seen this crazy picture of Beethoven uh, he must have been going deaf when this picture was taken it's one I had never seen another B composer we look at is Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi that you might not realize that his last name is Bartholdi. He only lived to age 38. And during that time, he wrote some fabulous things and spent a great deal of time in England. Another thing he did was he resurrected some of Bach's older works and um, brought them back into the public's eye and is probably uh, responsible for our seeing and hearing Bach today. Another wonderful thing about Mendelssohn is that he had an older sister by the name of Fanny. And she also oh, into this. Next, we look at the wonderful Leonard Bernstein and look at his many comp uh, compositions as well as his life as a composer. Another person I love to feature is Benjamin Britten, um, shown here with his dog. We look at Samuel Barber, the Adagio for Strings, which has been a very historical piece. And his quote, the highest goal of music is to connect one's soul to their divine nature, not entertainment. Pythagoras. Now I do a um, kind of an online group called Transitions that has been um, there for people who've been having to uh, cope with their transitions from their former life to their um, COVID life. Now we'll be transitioning out of that. 
All transitions including include gains and losses. Sometimes people like to discuss what's going on in their life around that. And that's what I do. Thank you, Marge. I so enjoy the music. Um, as a woman who loves Jane Austen and has read all of her novels multiple times and watched the movies even more time, um, your music resonates, your Bach uh, especially. Thank you. And please um, welcome now Margaret Joy Weaver. We're delighted that she's teaching. And forgive me, Margaret, for not moving you up the queue. I apologize for not noticing that. Mm -hmm. But Margaret, if you'll um, uh, tell us the name of your course and tell us um, about your course. Thank you. Beautiful. So first of all, hello, everybody. Um, the name of our course is going to be You and the Universe, Amazing Coincidences. And we'll be offering it uh, on Wednesdays at 1.30 to 3. And uh, who's going to be leading this is, many of you know, Barbara Luttrell. So she's facilitated many Ollie groups and and has been very fascinated with social, economic, and political environment. And she's now publishing, some of you may not know, and she edited Pat Corrington's new book, Amazing Coincidences, Little Gifts from the Universe. So I'll show a picture of that. It's now published on Amazon, which is exciting. And uh, also Pat Corrington herself, and she was born with an interest in spiritual aspects of life. She's an incredible storyteller. And um, so the book has stories, but part of it is not only the course will be in and around people learning to share these, these coincidences and synchronicities that occur. And, um, and then myself, so I've lived here, uh, this is my first time and Pat's first time leading an Ollie course. Uh, so, uh, we're very excited about it. Thank you so much. And um, so I've been living here for 25 years almost in Sedona. I've taken all the courses. I've never had one. And some of you may know me as the president of the Sedona International City of Peace. And I'm an avid learner and facilitator for transforming communication and awakening human consciousness. So this is Pat's book. Um, amazing coincidences, little gifts from the universe. Um, and so partly we're going to be really looking at the science and research that is in and around this, this topic. So many of you know, Jung uh, brought about the phenomenon called synchronicities. Uh, and these are apparently two seemingly unrelated, unconnected events that come together in, in a divine timing. And the more and more that we notice them, the more they're there. And many times they alter the direction of our life to just very fun things that happen. Um, so we'll be exploring those together each week, uh, even in the making of this, of this, um, uh, this class, Barbara was bringing, wanted to bring the book over uh, one morning and I was sitting in my living room and my dog started to bark and it wasn't really the time Barbara was coming but I walked outside to see and there's a woman I don't know who's kind of wandering at the end of the cul-de-sac and I asked her if she needed any help and she turned around and she had a book in her hands and she had the amazing synchronicities because Barbara wasn't able to make it and she was, had the wrong number for my house. And I just happened to walk out and see that. And I said, okay, this is going to be a really fun class. So thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Margaret Joy. And that is a, a beautiful um, synchronicity of connection. And uh, I'm so glad. Uh, I look forward to um, any course that Barbara Luttrell would do. So I know I'll be thrilled with that as well. So Thank you very much for being willing to teach for us. And I know you will have to leave by 11. So we appreciate your being here, but stay as long as you are able. And now I'm really excited for um, Kim Holland to present to us with her, um, her co-teacher, Bernice Hall. 
So if you two will unmute Moot and tell us about your class and you and what you're gonna do. You're still on mute. All righty. Is uh, Bernice here? Hi, Bernice. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Let me so our class is called Literary Periscope, Race in America. Let's talk about it, Kim. All righty. If I can get it up, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it there for a second. Is it on now? Not for me. My screen says loading. I'm assuming that's with the rest of us. Oh, there you go. Got it. All right. Is that it? You see it? Yes. Okay. I have a question for you, Bernice. All right. We don't have a lot of time, you know. Okay. Well, I'll keep it fast. What do Megan and Harry? Former President Trump, The Bachelor, and the Golden Globe Awards have in common. What an odd group to clump together. I have no idea. Well, they were all involved with issues concerning race. Oh, race seems to be a main topic of concern and interest in America and in the world. That's true, but... What is race? Well, there is no biological basis for, category, for categorizing humans by race. We are all incredibly similar genetically. Race is a social construct. So if race is a social construct and there is no definition for race, what will our class, Literary Periscope Race in America, be about? Our goals are to listen to voices of contemporary authors and their characters, to learn about African-American historical and cultural events that have been untold or forgotten, to reflect honestly, to ask critical questions about the world as it is, and imagine how the world might be otherwise. Well, I think it sounds fascinating. <laughs> Our two books are E. Ewing's 1919 and Tanisha Coates' The Water Dancer. So I look forward to with conversations with Bernice and anyone else who would like to be involved. Thank you. See you Thursday, April 8th. Sounds great. Thank you, Kim, and thank you, Bernice. Well done. And what a timely topic for us in our country today. So thank you. And I wanted to also take a quick moment here to mention, please remember we are moving closer to face-to-face. -face. So if you're teaching this term and maybe um, your enrollments aren't as large because what we've noticed our online uh, interest is not as great as our face-to-face, -face, please reconsider submitting some of your courses for the for um, summer if you're in town when we're very hopeful we'll be face-to-face -face. and if all continues to go well, face-to-face -face for the fall. So I'm excited for our next presenter um, to discuss, um, I will Lorna left this. So now it's Sharon Sherman. Um, if I had in my pinky just a little bit of what she knows, I would be so much better at leading these Zoom meetings. So, Thank you, Sharon, for teaching again for us. And Sharon is also teaching in our community education classes too. So she'll be teaching for them. Look for those flyers too. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? So I'm Sharon Sherman and I am the local geek for Ali. I work with computer technology and uh, consult and teach. And it is my pleasure to be doing so for Ali and for the uh, non-credit component. Indeed, the class I am teaching is Get Smarter 
about your smartphone, your smart devices, we are going to look at how they work and get down into the weeds. But the class is really a 360 degree view of the technologies that go into carrying around these amazing devices. Why do we care? Because they are life sustaining, not just for urgency and emergency and troubleshooting and time management and entertainment, but because they connect us. They maybe isolate us. They all have special moments. And that's why we want to know more about our technology because it's invaluable to us. Make no mistakes, we will be talking about the rise of the internet device. It's not just a phone. We'll talk about its history, its evolution over the last years, the infrastructure that makes it possible. What's its cell tower and an electromagnetic wave? And what are all those Gs? What is the evolution of the phone's ability to carry an internet signal that we value so much? And what is 5G? Is it real? Come and see. Why are there only three carriers right now? And what is an MNO? It's good to know if you have a cell phone. We'll talk about the hardware. That's what we carry around from their inception. It was an evolution. We were plugging along in the 90s and the 2000s. And then in 2007, the revolution came. <laughs> so come join the revolution. We're going to look at how it all changed and what we carry around now. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Apple. And what's the rise of Android? How'd that happen? We're going to look under the hood. We're going to see what the components are briefly. We imagine you have never seen somebody trash their $500 cell phone in front of you on purpose. <laughs> see a tear down and learn about the insides. We will look at the basic operations as well. We're going to have a special guest to do that. We will screen share our iPhone and our Android device so that we can stop and talk and learn more with the ability to see the, the screen itself. I think that's a nice asset. Things like screen components, how you navigate, special features, apps, what is a hotspot, We'll learn about voice control. It's really the wave of the future. All our devices working with our phone, our voices, and it's not hard. And I now text by voice. It's just so much easier. What's a widget? How do I personalize my phone? How do I get this on my phone? And we will conclude, but looking at the implications throughout, um, it's a conversation we'll have in the workshop. So bring your voices. How does it integrate and synchronize into the cloud and our other devices, devices? And what is Mac continuity? And if we have time, let's talk about maintenance and repair and purchasing. There's a lot of ground to cover here. So bring your voices and your questions and join me on April 9th at 9 a.m. for three hours. Hope to see you there. I have a question. Sure enough. How do I find my phone? Yeah, we can shove her the Find My Phone app. Yeah. I use Tile. So my keys have a little device and I beep on them because I lose my uh, phone just about every week, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon. I learn so much every time you do something like this. I even wrote down what MNO and um, I'm going to Google that, but I would do well, I would be well served to take one of your classes. Oh, I love that we have such variety. There are so many topics we can talk about relig um, religion and race and music and culture and travel and um, current events. This is and books. Um, 
Yes, Charles, did you have a question for Linda, Sharon? Yeah, just a quick one. I, can we confirm the date of Sharon's uh, session? April 9th. That's a Friday, right? Uh, I don't know, I think so, yeah. Okay. Right, Friday, 9 a.m., so gotta get up. Gonna make me get up and get at it. Okay, because I thought your slide might have said Thursday. Oh, gosh, I, it's an error. It's the night. So okay. that is... Uh, That's a Friday. Yeah, I believe it's a Friday. Sorry. No It'd be a shame for me to show up on Thursday, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. You're muted, Linda. I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> Our next presenter will be um, Mike Ward. And Mike, tell us about yourself. You're, this is your first time, I believe, to teach for Ollie. We're super excited. And tell us the name of your course. And like Charles said, maybe tell us uh, the day and time of your course too. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. My name is uh, Mike Ward. And uh, the name of my uh, program is the Geomorphology of Sedona and the Verde Valley. And it's on uh, Friday, April 23rd at yeah, one o'clock. See if I can get this thing to work here. And okay, are you working, looking at my slide? Mm -mm. There we go. Is it up now? Okay, uh, it's the geomorphology of Sedona and the Verde Valley. And <clears throat> I've uh, spent a lot of time uh, in geology. I'm not a professional. I uh, retired here over 20 years ago, or almost 20 years ago. And I've always been interested in geology, but I'm from the Midwest. It was uh, the occasional moraine or uh, a, a glacier till, I mean, who cared? But when I came out here, geology is in your face. And uh, let me get rid of this here somehow. There we go. But uh, I took a number of courses through Yavapai College uh, with Wayne Rainey, particularly. And uh, I ended up writing a book called uh, So Why Are the Rocks Red? Uh, basically, it was my uh, notes that I collected over the years, taking courses from. Uh, Wayne, and it's a tourist grade uh, book that's uh, sold very well. It's probably sold about five or 6,000 copies since it came out uh, just here in Sedona. And it's like I say, tourist grade. It's written in language I can understand. But I was actually more interested in how the land came to look the way it does. And that's geomorphology. And if you've ever been interested in that or wondered about how it came up, this four hour or three hour workshop is, uh, is for you. Um, we're gonna be talking about the physical things that uh, created the landscape that we see, volcanism, uh, with the faulting uh, like with the basin and range and the Laramide orogeny. Um, also, uh, we're gonna talk about deposition. In other words, where did all this stuff that we're looking at come from? And the most important part of it is erosion. Uh, that's the force that actually sculpted what we're looking at today. And it's all supported by a, uh, a PowerPoint program where I've animated a number of uh, uh, slides showing actually how things were deposited and how they wore away uh, and uh, where the volcanoes were. I've also got a section on sinkholes. There are seven of them in Sedona. I've got pictures and a lot of stuff about that. Uh, I was good friends with Paul uh, Lindbergh, who has since passed away, but he explored a lot of the sinkholes around here. And I have a lot of his graphics that uh, he actually created. So like I say, if you're interested in the geomorphology of uh, Sedona, how the landscape came to appear the way it is. And it's, as I say, supported by a animated PowerPoint program that I put together. Uh, please join us uh, Friday, April 23rd at one o'clock. 
Uh, I might also mention that uh, I've got an animation in the uh, Red Rock Ranger District Visitor Center uh, on their spin browser. Uh, I also spent a lot of time uh, putting together the terrain model that uh, you see in there whenever it opens again. So that's pretty much all I have. I look forward to seeing you and uh, I hope you uh, have a good day. Thank you, Mike. We're so glad that you're joining us and um, I'm gonna go look for Why the Rocks Are Rad by Mike Ward. That'll be nice for me to read when my grandkids come. So Gigi, that's me, can know a lot and share with them. Thank you so much. And you know, Mike, once we move to face-to-face, -to -face, it'll be fun to go outside and look at things with you. So appreciate it. I also wanted to just very quickly show you one item that I think will be of interest. I know Tony referenced this, but we are doing a free class called Create Your Legacy with the YC Foundation. And for those of you that have given to Ali or have any interest, this just shows you how the college functions, all um, our legacy program, and will be taught by two of our foundation professionals. And that is available. Oh, that charge, we're not charging for it. That, that was a misprint. So if you want to take that, you'll be getting an email saying that is a, uh, a free course. And they'll also be offered to our OLLI members in Prescott as well. They're offering it for both of us. So let's see what we have next. Um, uh, Margaret Joy already went. So Dariel Archer, who I'm looking forward to seeing in June when you're back in town, I hope, or whenever you come back through. Um, tell us about your course and about you, and I will move myself. Okay, let me pull my screen here. Well, my class has to do with using energy for self-healing. And having been in adventure and places where there wasn't always medical care right there, you're left to your own devices. And I learned through any number of adventures about how to work with energy of how to, you know, slow the blood flow down, how to stop some of the swelling, what you can do. And, and I call it energy first aid. And it's really a kit, you know, when you're hurt, you go get your Band-Aid or you go get this. And this class is really teaching people any number of ways to deal with pain. One of the things that we deal with, especially as we age, is all sorts of pains from anywhere from acute to chronic to intermittent. And one of the uh, ways that you can do it is part of what we think our body will automatically release the chemicals. If I'm happy, oh, you get the feel good chemicals. If you say I'm sad, oh, you get the little Debbie Downer um, chemicals. And so whatever you, your body's always listening, just like you're unconscious. And having been a hypnotherapist, I really got to witness firsthand many amazing things that people did once they believed something and they walked in and it was um, challenging. The brush off technique is, is a very fun one um, that uh, we can do right now. It just takes a couple minutes, but it lets you know that how heavy and, and what our thoughts are and whatnot. Um, that um, we just do it really quickly right now. If you wanna just like um, put out your left hand and put your right hand, uh, fingers on the top, thumb on the underneath, and just begin to like pull, like you're pulling off something and you really are. We collect things, our skin, our hair, we collect. And when we do that, have you ever walked in a room and suddenly you just wanna turn around and walk out or you rush home from work and you can't get wait to get in that shower to just get that stuff off. That's really actually a reality. So if, um, you'll feel that arm. And now if you put both arms up, the one that you just did, you'll feel a slight um, difference in the one that you brushed off. And, and if you have a lot of stuff, you may not feel it immediately. And then as always, you always do what you do on one side, you must do on the other. We want balance. We don't want you walking around like this. So again, so you put your right, uh, your left hand on your right shoulder, thumbs down, and you can begin to pull that energy out. I uh, was very fortunate that I got to go into a laboratory and really see how energy worked. And, and it's, um, so we'll put those back up again, and you can feel that they're more even now. And um, going back into that, I got to learn that our thoughts do matter and got to work with denutured DNA at, um, at HeartMath. 
from one of the scientists and we did a baseline and you would send it, you know, love, you know, <laughs> anger, whatnot. And the baseline, you know, it had its little bell curve. And then when you sent the energies, what it would change. But the most interesting thing is that 18 hours later, it was still changing because the anger one didn't have, it took a while for it to catch up to the bell curve. So it's really interesting because anger stays in our body six hours, feel good stuff, 15 minutes, because we're more conditioned to feel bad than to feel good. Um, one of the other techniques that is really wonderful and, and people really enjoy it is I call it the turn down the pain technique. And it's something that you can really do anywhere, anytime, any place to really make that pain subside. And once you begin to, to work with it, and, and I have a, a form, we rate it before you do the technique and then after, and people can't believe the um, difference from that. And it's, it's a very fun, amazing, and I like techniques that you can carry with you. You don't have to carry anything. You can use it right there. The other one that happens a lot that keeps us from healing or moving forward is what are our imprints? It's whether it's from our family or teachers or um, friends, watching other children as we grow up because we're set by the age of six. And by releasing those imprints, oh, cancer runs in our family, macular degeneration at 56, oh, colon cancer, you know, like at 69. And so all of these things that the body's hearing and the more you hear them at the gathering, your body goes, oh, is that what I'm supposed to do? I'm part of this family. And it's really amazing what, when you break those things, what happened in the freedom that people um, feel from that. So my class is like a deep dive into self-healing. A lot of it has to do with coming from a hypnotherapy point of view is our inner dialogue. I call them the hidden saboteurs waiting for you to, they're, it's, they're opportunistic. And when our body is hot, it means one thing of how energy is working. Our circulation's not really optimal. When we're too hot, we have inflammation and there are ways to immediately begin to regulate that. Um, I have a thing I call the relationship pie. Where's your energy going during the day? Is it all mental? Is it giving out to someone? Do you have any self-care time? Do you have any time for spiritual? Do you have any time to learn about current events? And then we go into affirmations or what I like to call directed affirmations where you're not, you're not just saying it, but you bring it. I really want this. I give myself permission. And again, body and unconscious always listening. And um, we can use everyday articles, food. Um, we can use our clothes that we wear. And we can just use imagining colors or looking at colors. Also the body, we are hardwired to respond to colors. So that is my class. I hope to see some of you there. And these are, you know, just a little bit more of the imprinting and where we go with that. We work um, pretty deeply on that because that really does make a difference in, in people's lives. And then this is my, my funny to me, um, healed by Darielle. Healed really stands for happy, healthy energy, always lives energized daily. And so when I think, oh, I'm healed, it's like, yeah, that's what I want. And it's like, I want to live my life. I don't want to do my life. And so next time you go, ah, oh, think I'm an awesome healer. So those are ways that you can impact and work with your mind and what you say to really be cognizant of what comes out of your mouth because it isn't just something you're saying. You have, you know, the iceberg, you're unconscious in your body, always listening. So smile, think happy thoughts. And I'm on Wednesdays, 11 to 12.30 Arizona time to learn self-healing. And thank you. It's always a pleasure. It's so much. What a... What an encouraging, positive way to conclude our presentations. This has been um, a real treat to, to think about uh, awesome healer. Ah. Awesome. Isn't that a fun <laughs> thing? Ah. 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 Um, we have a little bit of time. Um, I was hoping that Denny Fanter would make it. He's not here yet. 
Did anyone have questions they wanted to ask? And I, as I said, if you, um, um, I also have our um, year in review. If anybody is interested in that, I can send that to you or show that to you about, it was a good reminder for all of us about what happened in the last year. And I, I can send this to you in a PDF just when you see okay. all of the things we did. There's um, Kohaba who's teaching for us this time. Um, it starts from today and goes back. Close your eyes if you get sick with this, but we go all the way back to the beginning when we started. Oops, sorry, I went back too far. Oop, 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 there, March 16th, the day that we'll live in infamy. Um, and there we are with our COVID and our first, Paul was one of our first uh, uh, people to step up and volunteer. And we did a series of um, interviews with local Sedona leaders. Those are all available on our YouTube now if you're interested. Um, and we just went through our free programming. We, it was a good gut check for us to see how far we'd come and the things that we did during that time period. So I have that if anybody wants a copy, otherwise you'll get it um, in your email account from us. And then let me uh, just open it up. If anybody has any questions, comments, wants to talk about anything, the floor is yours. Right, does that mean you're leaving, Marg? Are no, you that means I have a question for Danielle. Okay. Danielle. Danielle and I have classes at the same time. But I have a broken arm and I want to come to your class. I'm trying to heal it. We'll come a half hour early and we'll work on it. Come about 15 um, minutes early and we'll work on it. I have a cool little bone stimulator here. Oh, I'm, those are very good. Yeah. Uh, trying to avoid surgery, but I have a class the same time as your class. I have a solution. Well, um, Marge has what we call an unlimited annual membership. So she can take as many courses as she wishes, any time, any whatever. Marge, all you have to do is send us an email saying, I'm going to enroll me in Dariella's course, and then we will send you the recording. That is the one huge benefit we have on Zoom, and you can watch the recording later of the class. And because you will be registering for that class, I'm abiding by FERPA. So you will have permission to view the teachings that you would get with Ariella. That's a solution. Sounds great. Wonderful. Well, and just using that one technique and then, and, and then like wherever it's broken, just really put your hand there and hold it. Like when you're doing the bone stimulation, because that low current is very good to stimulate um, from the, the kidneys that makes um, uh, the cells in that that go to help repair bones and the bone marrow in that. And just hold it and see it and smile to it because often when we're hurt, it becomes an orphan. It's like, oh, and we, and we kind of shy away. So bring it back in. It's like, I love you. You're going to work and keep sending pictures of when it worked perfectly. We want that. Remember, we Thank want you. those chemicals. You're more than welcome. Happy to help. Ray, did you want to say something? Uh, I definitely want to thank John Black and Bob Hazeman for all the help they gave in uh, teaching us how to use um, Zoom and which obviously I still haven't quite figured out. I don't know what happened, um, but um, th th they answered many questions by email and by phone and their tutorials were wonderful. And um, they, 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 I just really think they deserve a big thanks for, for all the help they've done with the Zoom technology. Thank you. I agree with you, Ray. And But Ray, you deserve props for being willing to learn and to try to figure it out with them. So thank you. But I agree, Bob Hazeman and especially John Black, he was here this week. We were looking at cameras, trying to figure out how we would, if we could do hybrid learning, what would we do? How would we do it? Um, but I want to remind everybody, I am so hopeful because we received the okay this morning to do our three outdoor classes and we will be petitioning that if the college goes to green, Ollie classes will also go uh, to green. And green means face-to-face, -face, socially distanced, careful learning, following up. We will still wear masks. We are still wearing masks here at the Sedona Center. Just even though the governor has uh, released um, the requirement, we as a college are still abiding by masking. Linda. Linda, can you say something about uh, scholarships? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tony. You're so good. Um, yes. Can you see my, I'm sharing my screen. We have need-based scholarships. So if you were to meet someone, a friend, and you say, oh, I'm teaching this course, and I'll honestly say, I don't have the money, or if you talk to an Ollie person that says, I didn't renew this year because I'm having a financial hardship, tell them to email Ollie, O-L-L-I-S-D, at yc.edu or to call our number. We will confidentially send the information that they must complete for us to administer the, the financial needs scholarship, but we do have money available for students who would like to participate. So let that not be the barrier to taking classes and to enjoying lifelong learning. Thank you, Tony, for reminding me. Thank you. Other, yes, Thank Charles? You. You know, I, it just, just occurs to me, and it may not, it may be too cumbersome, but uh, I tend not to use my vouchers. Um, I'd be happy to donate them if we, we could create a fund for scholarships, um, um, if that's of any use at all. It may be, it may be too, too, much, too much overhead uh, involved, but if it's possible, I'd be very happy to put my vouchers in the pot. Well, we do give you the option, those of you that don't need to use your vouchers, we're happy for you to use your vouchers because it's the, a small token of our great appreciation for all you do, just as a volunteer for the love of learning. But if you want to donate them, then we happily accept them back. Thank you, Charles, you're very generous. Um, yeah. um, so we, have, we, have, we I, I can't express enough. You know, about, um, I think about just over half of all the OLLI programs are like set up like ours where we, have lay members who are our teachers, members or members of the community. Um, many of ours, about a, a good solid third, rely completely on paid faculty through their, um, wow. their, like the University of Miami and American University. I believe John Hopkins is in that category. And there are a couple others I'm missing with it. They pay college professors or graduate students to teach, which is wonderful, wonderful. But um, there is a great beauty in the individual, um, the lay person, whether it's your area of expertise, like Mike, or whether you're working outside of your area of expertise and you teach a topic because you've self-taught yourself and you love it. That's the beauty of Ali is um, that passion for learning and sharing it with others. I think everybody's classes sounds interesting. I wish I could take them all. <laughs> right. <laughs> If I didn't need to work, I'd quit my job and come take all the <laughs> classes all day long. Well, that, that's the beauty of recording these sessions. You just have to sign up for it and, you know, you can get the recording. So at least you can watch it. Since most of you are what we have are facilitators here, I will give you a glimpse into what we're trying to figure out. Um, as we move forward, we're working. In fact, I had a meeting this morning with Steve Thaxton, who is the executive director for the National Resource Center that the Osher Institute provides for all of the OLLI directors and staff. Uh, we, we can ask him questions about the, what the foundation would like us to do, if it's something that we can't discover through looking at our agreement, or we can ask him about trends with other OLLIs. Um, what our intention is to offer some, not many, but hybrid classes in the fall because of our, um, um, our ability that, we have a limited staff, as you know. We've always had a small staff, but it's even smaller at the moment because we uh, don't have as great a need, nor do we have as great an income to pay that staff. But we will be taking some of our larger classes, say Ken Bork's class or a Paul Friedman class when you have 50 people and trying to make sure that those that have historically had big numbers that we can offer in-person and um, online learning and we would give the facilitator, like if Paul taught it, he could teach at home and be teaching to people that are in room 34 or room 28, or he could be in that room. Um, the pedagogy of teaching to people that are face-to-face -face with you and online at the same time is not simple. And most of us didn't grow up doing that. So it's a whole new ball of wax. Um, our, uh, but, and we also wanna, continue to offer strictly online. If there's someone that wants to keep their class online, either for their own health concerns or just because they prefer 
We've had many members like Ray even volunteered and said that for her with her vision issues, it's easier to have the computer and to learn online. And sometimes people who have hearing issues have said to me, I can hear so much better with looking at my computer and watching everything. So we're gonna to try to offer as much as we can within the limitations, being good stewards of our staff and our resources. As our members come back and we have more money, I'll be able to ask more uh, like Solaris Walsh, who is just a tech guru programmer. She's working five hours a week for us. I'd love to bring her back 20 hours so she can help us with things. Um, we'll work to that as we grow. Um, but um, I couldn't be more excited this morning when I received that email that, that, the, that they are entertaining this and that we had to go ahead for spring. Uh, any questions about that as we navigate new territory and learn from other institutes and from you all? And John Black, the good news, Ray, John Black's involved deeply with me in trying to figure this out. So we are offering classes in the spring in person. Is that what you're saying? No, we had, a, thank you, Sharon. We are doing everything online with the exception. Last fall, we reached that we had a few members who said they wanted to teach outside. And outside is considered our safe territory. And we had four classes last fall that we had hoped to teach and it didn't work. Three of those four instructors said, when we went back to them this spring, just saying, if maybe we get to go outdoors, will you teach? One was Ray and then Pam and Ernie of hiking classes said yes. Um, and so we got the okay this morning. So you'll get a flyer from us saying, here are three more classes. You can sign up. Ray had agreed to do hers online, but if we can move outdoors, she's going to move outdoors. And, um, I'll let Ray speak to that. But what we're looking for is Sharon. I actually think there's potential that we will be face to face. Um, the classrooms are already set up for socially distanced learning. It will stay that way for green learning. Only when we go to what we call the all clear, that means we can sit beside each other. We're just hoping to get to green so we can be in the same room with the socially distanced practicing and optional for those members that want to do it, but the face masks, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, being careful of space, all of those things. Uh, I have the world's largest bucket of hand sanitizer, uh, the towels that the college brings. They're as big as my head, one cleaner. Um, but so we, I think we're, I'm very, very hopeful about what's going to happen in the future. I'd like to uh, thank Linda for all of her hard work as, as we're going through this, but also I'd like to congratulate her on her new position as the director of lifelong learning. Well, Thank you, Tony. I, I was going to share that with you all. I'll put it in an email. On Thursday, um, our um, Vice President for Academic Affairs, which is what we fall under because we are academics, just the not-for-credit side, I was, um, I'm, I was promoted. I'm still an associate dean, but for lifelong learning. And so the um, OSHA director, uh, my, my counterpart in Prescott, now is my um, reports to me as well as the two community education director who already did here in um, Sedona Verde Valley, but now the Prescott um, uh, community education director, they all report to me. So um, here in the Sedona center, we are directing some of the programs in Prescott as well as what we already had in our purview. So I'm excited about that. And we are doing completely enrichment learning, which is what we do best. And uh, I think as we come out of the pandemic, I have a new boss. My new Dean is Tina Red who is the Dean of the Verde Valley campus, who I, uh, some of you probably, this is probably more information than you want to know, but I had two supervisors, the Dean or the VP of lifelong learning. And I uh, started with the Dean, then I reported to a v, uh, an AVP of lifelong learning, and also had a dot, dot, dot to Dean Red and the Verde Valley campus. I now report to Dean Red and the Verde Valley campus, who also has purview over programs in Prescott, um, she is the academic dean as well as over the lifelong learning program. Um, and she now everyone in the English, humanities and social sciences report to her in addition to her duties at the Verde Valley. So it's super news for those of us in the Sedona Verde Valley area, um, all of us. It's a reflection of our, um, uh, of our, I think it's a positive for our residents, our citizens, our OLLI members, our community ed, our traditionalist students. Um, the, so that's the news. That's very good news. 
Thank you, Ray. I thought you'd be happy. <laughs> so, Linda. Yes, Charles. If I could, I, I just want to, you know, add my congratulations to you, and we all know how well this deserved that is. I also wanted to uh, second Ray's uh, point, I think it was, about the tr the training that you've been giving us on Zoom, I made it. I made the mistake too. Just to, if you want to make this transition, unmute and then share a screen. It works. Um, it's really hard to make it right once you got it wrong. Uh, that was my mistake, but I won't do that again. I also I think John Black's uh, help on um, PowerPoints last week was extremely useful to me. Uh, you might have noticed that I actually have color backgrounds now, which I never had before. I was able to load images without any trouble. Now I'm working on, uh, which will become very important for my courses uh, in this session. Uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, loading and editing um, videos. And I, that's been a great growth experience for me. I get so much out of teaching here because I learned so darn much that I should have known before, but no one ever helped me. So here we are, uh, you know, helping one another, help other people. I think it's really cool. You know, Charles, thank you so much. We had a really super fun time, about a half a dozen of us on Friday with um, Rick and um, Char uh, John teaching, going over uh, PowerPoint. Um, Charles is an extremely fast learner. However, in the excitement of all that's what's transpired in the last couple of days, I forgot to post the PowerPoint recording um, I didn't get to put it in our newsletter or the link to it because it came, it takes a little bit, a few hours, depending on what else is in the queue ahead of me on the college, who else is using, goes to our Panopto accounts, but I need to send that out. We recorded it. It's informal, but fun. And if you do what Charles says and watch it, you can do exactly what Charles says, change the colors behind. I will put that on our YouTube or have Jen put that on our YouTube, hopefully by the end of the week. I just wrote it on my list. So I'm now at 101 things to do today. That's great. And by the way, I, I cheated because uh, I actually got, I opened up a, it was this presentation, I think. I opened up what I had. And then as we were working through it, I actually did it uh, during the uh, during the session. And by the time we were finished, it, it was all in place. And um, it, it's a really efficient way to learn this. And if you have to, you can stop the recording. That's even better. Yeah. Uh, but I was able to do it real time and with great results, I thought, for at least in terms of my own expectations. <laughs> I, um, I, I think, well, I did show you briefly, but the, there's so many people, Tony and Paul with his work on the, the, the community forum and Shri and so many people that have done so much. But when we did our year, year in review, the first person we put was John Black and Tigger. Those of you that early on remember how John would bring Tigger. So he said, I have two, two screens set up so I can see what's going on. And, um, and John is such a, a, a humble, gracious man. He always is like, well, you're welcome. When you thank him, like, why are you doing that? But I, I agree, if you have a moment and wanna send him an email, say, tell him that as well. Um, I gave him a t-shirt. I'll give him a coffee cup. 